and welcome to this video. This is for AQA and this is Organic Analysis. Uh, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloryTutors.com and the whole point of this video is basically just to do a revision of the topic for uh, Organic Analysis. Um, now this is obviously specifically for AQA. Um, these PowerPoints that I'm going to use on here that I've made uh, they can be purchased so if you want to use them to enhance your your revision or to supplement it you can put them on your uh, mobile phone and um, you can look at them on the bus on the way to college or school or whatever then you can uh, purchase them if you just click on the link in the description box below the video and you'll be able to get a hold of them there now like I say this one is specifically for AQA and I've matched this to the specification for the AQA syllabus so these are all the spec points that have come from the AQA site. Okay, so let's have a look. So we're going to um, test for alcohols. Now obviously for this topic we're going to be looking at obviously the, the analysis of compounds um, using spectral techniques and also um, the testing for chemicals using what we call wet lab testing. So these are like chemical tests. So we're just going to look at them ones first. Okay, so how we can test for an alcohol and um, we basically use acidified potassium dichromate which is K2Cr2O7. So it's quite a, a big molecule um, and this can be used to distinguish between primary, secondary and tertiary alcohols. So alcohols all look similar, they're all like colourless liquids. So we're just using this to identify them. Okay. So what we do is we um, use acidified potassium dichromate and it oxidizes the primary and secondary alcohols, but not the tertiary ones. Okay. So basically your primary and secondaries are oxidized. You use dichromate, which is a mild oxidizing agent. And if you have a primary or secondary alcohol, it will turn from orange to green. Okay, so you get this color change. So um, this is a, a, a basically helps you identify if it's a primary or and a secondary alcohol. And um, if you did that with a tertiary, they can't be oxidized using dichromate. Okay, so basically it would just remain orange. Now, the problem lies really with primary and secondary alcohols because they both give the same color change. So we can't identify between these two just using this on their own. So what we have to do is we use fractional distillation. So this setup here, okay, to collect the products produced upon oxidation. And then what we have to do is then test the product to see if an aldehyde or a ketone is formed. So obviously we heat the substance here, we separate them out and we get the product in here. Okay, so we oxidize obviously the primary and the secondary alcohol. And then what we do is we test the product uh, that is produced when we oxidize the primary and secondary. Um, so let's have a look. Okay, so your aldehydes are made from primary alcohol. So if we formed an aldehyde, then um, it means that the initial alcohol was primary. If we formed a ketone, it means the initial alcohol was a secondary alcohol. So obviously we need to know how to test for these as well. And we can use failing solution. This can be used to distinguish between your aldehydes and ketones. Uh, failing solution, sometimes it's known as Benedict's, they're similar, not quite the same, but they're pretty similar, uh, is an oxidizing agent, uh, and so oxidizes aldehydes, but it won't do that for ketones. Okay, so let's just have a look at what we've got here. So we've got a failing solution, there it is. Uh, failing solution is blue, as it contains copper 2 plus ions. If you add it warm to aldehydes, um, then you get this blue solution turning to a brick red precipitate. This is copper oxide. So there it is there. It's in a hot water bath and it goes this brick red precipitate is formed if we have an aldehyde. If we have a ketone there, it just remains blue and nothing happens. Okay, so make sure you understand this setup and what we use this for. Obviously, we need a water bath as well, which is hot. Okay, we can also use another test, which is Tollens. Um, basically, this distinguishes between aldehydes and ketones as well. Um, so Tollens reagent is made um, and then it's used to distinguish between them. So basically there's the silver nitrate solution. This is colorless. Okay, so we have to make it first. We then add a, a few drops of sodium hydroxide and just get this pale brown precipitate. Um, and then we add a few drops of dilute ammonia um, until the precipitate dissolves. And then what you've made is your uh, Tollens reagent. So this is your Tollens. So make sure you know how to make the Tollens in the first place. And this is pretty much basically it. Then once you've got your tollens, then all you have to do is you basically do the same thing as what we did last time. There's our beaker there. So we add an aldehyde or a ketone to the tollens reagent, place it in a hot water bath. Um, we don't use a Bunsen. Aldehydes and ketones are obviously flammable. We don't want flames coming at the top of the test tube or anything. So we literally just um, add it hot. And then if you have an aldehyde, then you get this silver 
precipitate that coats the inside of the flask because it reduces the silver nitrates, your your tollens, uh, silver nitrates, so it reduces your tollens reagents, silver nitrates is what you start with. Um, and if you have a ketone, you get no silver precipitate is formed. So that's pretty important because it's allowing you to distinguish between an aldehyde and a ketone. Okay, test for alkenes. So this is pretty straightforward, to be honest, this one. Uh, you just add bromine water to it. So what we do is you add bromine water to your alkene. There it is. Make sure you put a, a, a bung on top of it. You don't want the stuff going everywhere. Uh, and then you basically give it a good shake, okay? And once you've, uh, once you've shaked it, you should get, if an alkene is present, you should get a colorless solution that's forming. Um, and that's a classic sign of an alkene. Now, bromine water um, is actually, what's happening here is it's reacting with the double bond uh, and we're forming a dibromoalkene, which is colorless. Now, obviously, you'll need to know this reaction anyway and the mechanism for it. Um, this is in the al um, alkenes topic um, when you're adding bromine to it. So you do need to know that mechanism. Okay, uh, test for carboxylic acids. Right, so carboxylic acids, um, basically you are um, reacting it with a carbonate. So you add a carbonate to it and um, pretty straightforward. So here's a one here. There's your um, your uh, acid in here, or your potential carboxylic acid, which is the liquid. You add a carbonate to it and it should start and fizz if there's a carboxylic acid present because it's acid plus carbonate. Um, and what you produce is carbon dioxide gas, which is here. Okay, so these react with um, um, lime water and in lime water turns cloudy, okay, if there's carbon dioxide present. So this is a, a test for carboxylic acids. Add a carbonate, if it's a carboxylic acid, you produce carbon dioxide gas. Okay, super carbonate would be something like sodium carbonate um, or um, you can use it as a solid or you can use it as a solution, that would be fine. Um, you have got to be careful though because other acids will react in the same way. So it's not a dead cert that you've got a carboxylic acid if, a, if you get carbon dioxide when you add a carbonate. Um, other acids will do that as well. Um, so you'd have to do, um, you'd have to look at obviously other spectral techniques to try and identify that it is a carboxylic acid. So you wouldn't do this on its own effectively. Okay, so let's look at some spectral techniques. So one of the ones you need to know is mass spectrometry, okay? So mass spectrometry is basically used to find the relative molecular mass or the MR of a compound, okay? So it's pretty useful. The MZ bit at the bottom here, um, this basically is just the, um, the mass of a fragment. Because remember when these things go through a mass spectrometer, the molecules are broken up into smaller bits called fragments. And these are the fragmented bits here, okay? Um, and when it goes through a mass spectrometer as well, we knock an electron off the molecule, leaving a positive charge. So we say that it's got a plus one charge. This is the Z bit here. Yes, they give the letter Z. Don't know why, um, but they do. They give it a letter Z. So this is mass to charge ratio. Um, and basically, this is just the mass divided by the charge. Most of the charges are plus one. So it's just mass divided by one, which is just the mass of the fragment. Um, and these are the fragments that you get here. Now, this peak is really important, this M plus 1 peak. This shows the um, the mass of the original molecule. Okay, This is called the molecular iron peak. So this is the molecule that hasn't been fragmented. The whole thing's gone through, uh, and we've literally just got a charged full molecule here. Now, this is basically the same as the relative molecular mass of the molecule. So that's pretty important. So, for example, in this one here, we have a molecule that has a molecular mass of 50. So we've helped to narrow it down just a little bit. I know there's a lot of molecules in the mass of 50, um, but we'll look at a technique which could try to improve on that. Okay, this technique um, is high resolution mass spectrometry. Now this is where, um, this is the kind of, this solves this problem that we've just literally just talked about in that last slide. So high resolution mass spectrometry is useful when identifying different molecules with the same molecular mass rounded to the nearest whole number. Standard mass spectrometry basically uh, gives you a mass to the nearest whole number. Uh, high resolution can do it to a much higher degree of decimal places. So these basically do it to several decimal places, and like your standard one, like I say. So let's look at an example. Ethanol, CH3CHO, and propane, C3H8, all have an MR44 to the nearest whole number. Now, if you had to put these two in a machine, the mass spectrometer, you wouldn't know which one's which. So we need something a little bit more 
um, refined. So this is called a high resolution mass spectrometer. So if we use the atomic mass data, as you'd be given these, um, and we can measure it to four decimal places. Um, and we could be able to distinguish the two. So if we look at, here's the precise mass of carbon-12, hydrogen and oxygen. These are the numbers to four decimal places. Now, if we look at the molecular mass of your um, ethanol, which is here, if we add all them numbers up, we should get 44.0302. If we look at the molecular mass of propane, which is C3H8, that will give us a molecular mass of 44.0624. Now, you can see, if I round both of these, we get both of them are rounded to 44, but using a high resolution mass spectrometer, you can see there's a difference in the masses of them. So the masses are actually slightly different. So we can identify and distinguish between these two. So yeah, so you can see it's pretty important, dead easy really to work out. Just make sure you include all your decimal places, don't be tempted to round. Okay, infrared or IR spectroscopy. Okay, so IR, uh, uses infrared radiation to increase the vibrational energy of current bonds in a sample. Um, so this is relatively straightforward. The spectra look a bit scary, but it shouldn't be too bad. So basically the frequency of infrared radiation absorbed by a covalent bond depends on certain factors, okay? So basically it depends on the atoms that are either side of the bond. So if the, if the atoms are pretty heavy, you're going to get a different vibration, uh, different frequency to ones which are lighter and the position of the bond in the molecule. So in other words, where is that bond? Is it near an OH? Um, is it near uh, a carbonyl group and a carboxylic acid, for example? This is all gonna have an effect on the vibrational energy of the covalent bond. That's when it absorbs infrared. Now you'll have a data sheet in your exam and the data sheet will have all these numbers on here. Obviously you've got the different bonds and you've got the wave numbers, etc. So let's look at this one. This is an infrared spectrum of ethanoic acid. So we've got all these different peaks here. What we're going to do is we're going to assign some of the, the peak numbers to this here and try and identify what we've got. Now, if you see this one, they've got a peak here. If you look, and this might be quite small for you, but if you look here, we've got about a, a peak at about 3000 uh, CM to the minus one. Now this suggests, if I go over here, a peak of 3000 suggests an OH as an acid. So it's there, look. Okay, so this suggests that we have an acid, OH acid. OH is also defined by really broad peaks around here. Okay, notice the difference. You've got OH acid and you've got OH alcohol. It's definitely not alcohol. Alcohol will be a bit shifted further over here. So we know it's an acid and we've got a peak here. Now this peak is a carbonyl group. Look, C double bondo, it's coming in at around 1700 centimeters to the minus one. There it is there, okay, it fits within this range. So we know this must be a carboxylic acid or potentially could be a carboxylic acid uh, because we've got C double bond O and an OH. I mean, it could be just a, a ketone and a, or an aldehyde and an alcohol, but um, looks more likely to be an acid because mainly this OH group, if we look at the spectrum, it's got an acid here, it says acid. So that, that tells us that this is probably gonna be ethanoic acid. Okay. Just a little bit more on this kind of um, infrared stuff. Here's the same spectrum that we had before. Now, we're going to look at something called the fingerprint region. Now, you don't have to worry too much about this. You don't have to read it. But what it does, it allows us to identify specific molecules. So this is where infrared's really powerful. So the fingerprint region lies between 500 centimeters to the minus one and 1,500. So this is like this green box here. Okay, and like a real fingerprint, the size and position of the peaks are unique to that particular molecule. So this is great because we can actually use this very unique set of peaks and compare it with a library of known spectra. And from that, we can actually identify the molecule. So a bit like a fingerprint on you, um, if you were to, um, let's say if you had a criminal um, and a criminal committed a crime, the police will have a database of fingerprints um, if they've come into contact with that person previously and if they were to commit a crime again they could compare their fingerprints with a library of known fingerprints on a computer and they can match the two up obviously the culprit and um, obviously the fingerprint that they've got so this is very similar to this as well so we've got this if the computer has um, knows about this pattern and knows what this is if you put this through the machine it will detect this pattern and say ah right this compound is ethanoic acid so really useful but you're not expect obviously to re read all this because it's really, really this bit's normally really messy at this end okay extra peaks in the fingerprint region indicates that you could have impurities so if you've got loads and loads and loads of peaks 
you've probably got other compounds in there that your infrared's picking up and that gets a bit messy. So it's really important to purify your sample before you put it into your infrared. Otherwise, it gets a little bit confused. Okay, we need to make this link as well between infrared and global warming. Okay, so greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, um, these absorb infrared radiation. So your greenhouse gases are things like carbon dioxide, which we'll look at in a minute. So electromagnetic radiation or EM radiation from the sun, it reaches the earth and is absorbed by the land and sea. So that gets absorbed. Some of this is then re-emitted as infrared back out um, towards the earth. Normally this happens mainly at night. Okay, your greenhouse gases are things like carbon dioxide, water, methane. Now, I think the, the most confusing thing is some people think water. Hang on, water is naturally there, and it is, and it is a greenhouse gas as well. Basically, you're looking for two different atoms. Um, all of these have two different atoms, and so these are going to be greenhouse gases. Okay, so these greenhouse gases here, these absorb that radiation that's, been, that's trying to escape from the Earth, uh, and they emit this back down towards the Earth. And um, we call this a greenhouse effect. So in other words, the heat is not being allowed to escape. Um, and so we get an overall warming of the earth. Um, and actually what's absorbing this infrared radiation is the covalent bonds, just like in the infrared spectroscopy. Okay, so you've infrared is absorbed by the covalent bonds and the covalent bonds start wiggling around a lot more. They start stretching and bending and, and all sorts because they're absorbing this, this energy. And infrared's just measuring that stretch and bend. So... What's causing all this? Well, a lot of people, most scientists believe that it's human activities that's causing this greenhouse effect. Burning of fossil fuels, landfill uh, produces methane because you're getting decomposition um, and all of this stuff. So this is entering the atmosphere. Uh, and we call this gradual warming of the Earth global warming um, because obviously it's happening on a global scale and the Earth, the whole Earth can warm up as well. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, so it's not too bad. Two key things there, really. Uh, three main things, sorry. Your wet lab testing, make sure you can identify for your different functional groups. Your mass spectrometry and your infrared. Obviously, they're your two separate spectral techniques for identifying. And remember, you use all of these. You don't just use one of them to identify a compound. You have to use uh, a few of them and um, try and work them out from there. But um, like I say, these PowerPoints, if you want to use them for your revision to supplement your, your revision material that you've got, you can purchase them. Just click on the link below um, in the uh, box, in the description box. They're pretty good value um, and they probably could be quite useful. You can use them as a, an electronic revision aid. Uh, but that's it. Bye bye.